and welcome to another episode of Breakcast Movie and TV Talk. The highly anticipated first chapter of the Transformers War for Cybertron trilogy has landed on Netflix, and that is what I'm going to be talking about. I was going to use the new format for this, but I typed this at a time I couldn't record it, so I'm just going to be reading a script on camera. <laughs> Anyway, there probably will be spoilers, so you have been warned. The first point I want to start with, because you know it's the first point, that's where you're supposed to start, is the voice acting somewhere in the middle. You have really good voice acting like Megatron, Starscream, Jetfire, and Lita One. Then you have ones that are fine enough not to stand out as really good or really bad, like Sideswip, Chromia, Hound, Impactor, Prowl, and Cog. Then you have the not-so-good ones like Optimus Prime, Ironhide, Soundwave, and Shockwave. I just can't believe that this is one Transformers show that I want Prime to stop talking because I really don't like his voice. I watched the Transformers Slack podcast review of Siege, and they pointed out that Prime's voice was something they didn't like. They also went easy on the voice acting because the show had budgetary restrictions, but here's the thing. There are a few shows, especially Transformers shows, because this is what we're talking about, that can do Optimus Prime's voice without Peter Cullen being the voice actor. Transformers Animated is a good example of this, even though it's one of those shows I don't like as much as, say, Transformers Prime. Look what happened in the Combiner Wars show. Prime's voice was terrible, and then they brought in Peter to finish out Titan's Return and Power of the Prime. Prime's voice in Siege just seems like the guy was trying to do his best Peter Cullen impression. I don't care if the show had budget restrictions, the voice actors are hired to put their best performance forward, and some did and some didn't, and it really does show. Even despite the fact that the voice actors had to do it uh, one at a time anime voice actor style, but you have to put your best effort forward. My second point is the reuse of character designs as background characters. There were so many clones of Cog, Ironhide, Sideswipe, Mirage, Prowl, again, aside from the ones that are obviously supposed to be clones, like Ratchet, Red Alert, Barricade, and all the Seekers, there were just random background characters. Like, there was a blue Sideswipe looking bot. Okay. This is where you see the show's budget restrictions, so I suppose I can excuse this this one time. The other thing to talk about related to character models is that they used the toy design 100% for their on-screen characters. Like, you know, the, with all the weapon ports and points where blast effects are supposed to attach to the toys, they're on the character models in this show. And Rodimus Primal even said in his review that the guys at Hasbro just sent over the CAD designs for the toys to the... I think it was Polygon Pictures who did the animation. And I'm like, okay, but you should have cleaned up the design and streamlined the designs as much as they do, just like in the current IDW Transformers comics. The third point is the story. The story felt rushed because of the fact that this chapter is composed of six 20-minute episodes. So things like character development get shoved to the side so the focus was on the overall story. The story is simple because it's the Autobots going after the Allspark before the Decepticons do, and then using the Ark to get the Allspark off-world with the use of a space bridge. That right there has things from past Transformers media. The Allspark is made prevalent through the first three Michael Bay movies and in Transformers Animated. Space bridges were used in G1 and in Transformers Prime, as far as I know. The last episode made me think of the end of the video game, Transformers Fall of Cybertron, where Optimus Prime and Megatron were in a fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat as both their ships were going towards the open space bridge portal. The space bridge in Siege 
who's more like how they were in G1. But you have Prime and Megatron fighting for the Allspark before Prime gives it a happy throw. And what I mean with the Space Bridge is like, in um, Fall of Cybertron, the Space Bridge would open like this way, right? It was like, like a circle this way. So they're coming through the Space Bridge. But in this at NG1, the Space Bridge is a circle like this, so they have to fly up through it. Anyways, um, Jetfire was really the only bot that got any character development. He starts out as a Decepticon, but realizes that Megatron's vision of Cybertron isn't for him, so he betrays the Decepticons and Joyce and the Autobots. It was nice seeing how Prime and Alita One have a very close relationship, and I think they were about ready a few times to profess their love to each other, but they didn't. And that's fine, because it wouldn't have done anything for the story. Omega Supreme makes an appearance in the last episode just to protect the space bridge, and that's fine. They didn't overuse him. There are some pretty interesting deaths, too. Moonracer gets torn apart by the Sparkless. Spinister gets thrown down and lands on a spike, which goes through his chest. And the one they really played up the death of is Ultra Magnus. I mean... That episode, it was raining out in Cybertron. I'm going to assume it was rain. I don't know Cybertron's weather. But it was raining, and then when, when they shot him, there was just no music, nothing. No background noise at all. It was a very ceremonious death in an unceremonious situation, too. I really just found the last episode interesting because you don't have the Decepticons and their ship tailing the Ark as both were headed through the Space Bridge. It was interesting that Elita One, Chromia, Jetfire, and Red Alert remained behind on Cybertron after the Ark went through the Space Bridge. Of course, the final shot is of Teletron 1 saying there's a ship inbound, but the whole bridge is dark and you don't know if anyone survived. I mean, obviously they probably will. But the question is, who? And the final point is where this is going to be going forward. I think it's a good first chapter. This chapter is not bad. In fact, it's good, as I just said. Obviously, the next chapter is going to be Earthrise. I do hope they do more than six 20-minute episodes so we can have more character development time. I am certain that the ship following the Ark will be the Nemesis. And I am so curious to see what form the Nemesis will take. I always liked how the video game, uh, Transformers War for Cybertron and Fall of Cybertron did it, where the Nemesis was the modified alternate form of Trypticon. So it'll be interesting to see how the Decepticons acquire their ship. I hope the voice acting gets better as well. And don't just bring in Peter Cullen to do Optimus Prime, because I want whoever is voicing Prime, just do their take on Prime. Don't try to sound like Peter Cullen. One thing I almost forgot is that the music was very generic and forgettable, and the sound effects were pathetic. As I said, this is a good first start in this trilogy, and it did way better than Combiner Wars did in the first part of the Prime Wars trilogy. I would recommend giving Siege a watch, as it's good and only takes like two hours. That's all I have to say, so if we end in the conversation, leave a comment below. As always, thanks for listening and goodbye.